So I'm incredibly honoured this week to have one of the most well-renowned war game designers in the business and inventor of the coin system, and that's Folko Runke. Folko, welcome to the show, and thank you for giving over your time. Well, th thanks for having me, Ben. Great to be here. So this first question, and I, I tell everybody this when we start, if you have any sense of modesty, this is where you turn the modesty down to zero. And this is a question where you can, you can fully brag. So the, the first question is, is when did you know you were good at what you do? Uh, okay, so I, you know, I, I had a career in, in, in government and uh, board games, commercial board games is a commercial enterprise. It's a feedback rich environment and you have a bottom line, you know, people are buying it or not. And more importantly for me, whether they're spending their free time playing your games, you get a, you know, you get a sense of that. Um, but the, but the, the moment was for me, um, whatever came afterwards, when we were debuting my first published uh, game with GMT, which was Wilderness War in, in 2001. This happened at the World Board Gaming Championships that had grown out of Avalon Hill in Baltimore. Mm. So at a hotel north of Baltimore. And we had had a giant like demo set um, printed up uh, of the of the game, uh, which is about the French and New War. And my developer and I were like preparing it and cutting out these pieces and everything. And finally, we were able to set it up. We had the production um, cards and you know, support materials, plates and so forth. And we had the first group that we were teaching the game. And pretty soon, you know, they were they were kind of off and running and, and I wasn't there anymore. And they're playing the game and they're enjoying it. It's just them and the game. And I was like, okay, you know, mission accomplished. Mm. What, I, however well it sells or not, here are, here are people enjoying this. And so... You know, it's almost impossible, I guess, for a person to be a designer before they're a player. So I assume you must have been a player for some time before you leapt into design. So, oh, yeah. so what is your history as a gamer? So I laid eyes on my first board war game when I was in fifth grade and, you know, started playing them about, uh, you know, a year after that with my friends. So I was a a board game player, especially a war game player for, um, wow, almost not quite 40 years, I guess, before I was published. Is that right? Holy cow. 70s, 80s, 90s, 30 years. Yeah. 30, let's say 30 years. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, my little 30. <laughs> We're, we're, we're getting older every day. So um, what kind of games were you playing then? Were, were you brought up on the sort of classic Avalon Hill war games then? Very much so, yeah. So for France 1940 was my first one. Panzer Blitz, pretty soon, Squad Leader. And the SPI uh, Games and Game Designs Workshop, GDW. In the 80s, Victory Games was a staple. And, and, then, and then in the 90s, uh, GMT. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the only sort of... Um, the only one of those that I've played, and I, I guess you could debate whether it's part of those games, was Magic Realm. And I, I played Magic Realm and I was appalled, frankly, at how complex it was. You know, this is someone coming from the Eurogame arena. Um, were you someone who embraced that complexity and relished that sort of granularity of rules? I, I suppose so, um, although I had friends who played what, you know, what we called monster games, which is not like, you know, mythical monsters, but just mm. because they're so giant, you had to set them up on a, 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 a ping pong table, you know, in your basement, multiple maps, and you could barely read them, you know, and I was, uh, that was somewhat intriguing, but it, I didn't kind of revel in the, you know, in the volume of it um, as, as much as what I guess I... I reveled in and what led me to embrace this, the study of something was I thought these games were windows on real life history. And, uh, and that's what I, I wanted to know. How did these things work? And I wanted to understand these military campaigns or tactics or whatever it was. And, and so it seemed that the more complicated a game was, the closer, you know, the higher fidelity it had to reality because reality mm. is that way. You know, reality has lots of people and little bits and things like that and lots of interactions. So I guess I figured if I'm putting the effort in to study a very complicated game, I'm getting closer to history. And 
what's the what what's the thing with history was it games i i had mark herman herman on this show and i think i asked him the same question was it games that got you into history or was it history that got you into games i think it, it was as i mean it's of course both you know and it, 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 i think underlying your question is yes there's a synergy right there's a there's a cycle and interaction there but i do think it was largely it was first games getting me into history it was seeing that game with a cool looking cover and a guy in a helmet throwing a hand grenade and that kind of thing, you know, that seemed like playing soldiers, right? Um, but was more serious uh, in some way. And and so, for example, as I said, my first war game that I owned in sixth grade was France 1940. Well, I took the materials from that game and I used it as the principal source for a, for a you know, a little research project for, for school, for grade mm -hmm. school, you know, writing a paper about that campaign largely cribbed from the game. And, and then later on, it would be the games that might lead me to read books about it. And, you know, because if it was the, if it was an engaging game, it got me more interested in the setting. And then I wanted to know more than I had in the game itself. And, uh, and so eventually, I mean, I was a bored war gamer and interested in military history in that way from sixth grade on. When I get to undergraduate college i become a history major but it's not, not coincidentally right i think the mm. second grew out of the first and and so have are you are you just a war gamer or do you dip your toes into other arenas do you play euro games do you play sort of you know ameritrashy type stuff fantasy stuff i, I do and uh and you know so i i adore dune for example and mm. War of the Ring. And I mean, there's still games about conflict. And I think something that I like the most is they're games that do have a specific setting, right? There's a there's a canon. You know, if it's a game about Star Wars, it, it comes from something that, that pre-exists and it's trying to simulate that something, right? As if it were a real world. So it doesn't have to be real life. But I do think for me, and I and I know this is not, you know, necessarily um, common among board gamers. But I do think for me, it's that, you know, it's that window into some other place and time, real or fictional, that's the, that's the, the, the central charm of board gaming. And do you become immersed? For you is, so I, I guess essentially what you're saying is that the game has to be thematically grounded. For, for, yes. And I've, and I, I played chess uh, a good amount of the time. I played poker with friends every, you know, Friday night and so forth. But for me to get immersed, yeah, I have to feel like it's it's taking me somewhere. And so, you know, you're you're a player, you've been playing for 30 years, you're you're steeped in complex, you know, simulations of battles. It's led you to, you know, a history degree. What made you into the murky world of game design then? Well, it, so as I said, I, I thought that if I, you know, learned to play these games and, and, and studied them in a way, it was a medium to explore history, to discover more about human affairs. In my case, I was particularly interested in military affairs. And, uh, and in that way, you, you start out, I think, you know, if you're a freshman in college, you're kind of receiving wisdom, right? By the mm. time you're a senior, you're like, well, this professor, you know, knows this much, but not that. And this professor has this particular bent. And, and I'm now, hopefully I've learned in my education to be critical, right? Yeah. And to think for myself. Well, I had a similar education, I think, as a, as a war gamer. When at first, what comes in these rule books is, is like gospel. These are professionals, you know, they've, they've made a study of this and these maps are all accurate and the, the details are all meaningful because otherwise why would they be in there and so forth, right? You have that kind of innocent receipt of, 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 of knowledge. But of course, at some point you discover, well, well, wait a minute. No, actually there are different opinions, there are different interpretations and there are mistakes. I mean, I had my particular epiphany was playing a particular game about Operation Market Garden in Holland. And in the game, there's a you know, on the river, there's a cliff with a castle and the, you know, the allies have to like, you know, the Germans would put an anti-tank gun up in that castle and the allies would have to like storm across the bridge and take the, ca so I wanted to go see that. And I was on a trip through Holland as, as a student and I went, well, Holland's flat. There's no cliff. There's no mm -hmm. castle on the cliff. There is a castle that was in the town on the other side of the river. And I'm like, well, what's going on here? And I realized that 
I might be able to improve it. I could, des I could change out the boards of this game and have a more accurate representation. And, and then suddenly I'm like, okay, well, wait a minute. If I can improve that, board games are so wonderful, unlike, let's say, computer games, because I can just take a pencil and I can change any rule mm -hmm. I want. You know, I mean, I bought it. I, I, can, you know, I don't have to play it the way it's printed. I can, you know, start tinkering. And I started tinkering. That was in the 1990s. And I'm pretty soon I'm participating in play testing and then doing um, scenarios for games or expansions or variants where I'm sharing with other people how I think this might be more to my taste or more accurate or whatever. Um, and then at some point, um, I fell in love with a particular topic, happened to be the French and Indian War. I knew all the games in the market on that topic. I had done a paper campaign with my friends, kind of like a, almost like a role play, but it's historical mm. setting, which requires for a lot of research and creativity and all that. And I had amassed all that and that worked out well. And finally, a friend of mine said, well, you should just design, you know, a, a board game about that. And I was like, well, yeah, perhaps I shall. And that's what I did. And that became Wilderness War. And so what you're most well known for is the coin series, which I, you know, I was guilty of thinking that war games were simply reenactments of battles until um, until a few coin titles came out that, that grabbed my attention. And I know you didn't design this one, but but Gandhi was the one that really made me think, I want to play this because, you know, it's I'm British and it's a... It's such a vital part of British history, and I, I just watched Gandhi the movie for the first time and all of that sort of stuff. And what really blew my mind was how the coin games are not just battles. What they are is actually balancing politics, and it felt like the sort of the real world, not just a sort of representation of a part of a war. And so how did you come up with the idea of wanting to make these games that looked into the politics, that looked into the sort of human condition of the war rather than blocks on a map? Well, you know, fast forwarding, I had a career in, in intelligence analysis and eventually in the last third of that career as a, an instructor of analysts. And, uh, and so one of the, um, areas that we trained military analysts, we trained political analysts, we trained economic analysts and so forth. And so this idea that, first of all, that there are disciplines and you can use the same medium to uh, explore these various aspects of human affairs, that already was, you know, evident. And in terms of military, and that they overlapped, right? That, that, that a division between politics and economics and military affairs, well, these are you know, our convenience, if you will, mm. because we have to specialize. But in fact, all things in, in, in life are interrelated, right? And, and all of them are going on at the same time. And so, so a, a mode of warfare that was both very important to us in terms of understanding national security challenges, insurgency, um, and counterinsurgency, um, and that we therefore studied and taught our analysts about, um, uh, I realized was, was vastly underrepresented in the war gaming board game mm. part of the hobby. That is, most board games were about big conventional wars like the Napoleonic Wars and World War II and so forth. Um, but there were many, many more internal um, wars, such as insurgencies and counterinsurgencies, and you know, only a few games um, about them here and there. So I had a, sort of an idea that there was a commercial market, but I also had a colleague who used board games to teach analysts at work. Uh, and so I thought, and so that in, sort of inspired me to put those things together and, and try to convince my own board gaming tribe, the, the war gamers, hmm. that they should play a game about something that's not the usual topic but is about insurgency. So, so then what, what's, what are the elements of insurgency? Well, insurgency is very often factional. It is, it is a very meshed um, endeavor. It's a strategy that meshes politics at the, the local up to the national and international level with military means, with terror, with propaganda, with uh, economic attrition and so forth. So the, the heart of it in, by a lot of theory is 
where a, a people wants to give its, you know, give its legitimacy, wants to give its support. And that's what you're struggling over more than you're struggling over, you know, physically controlling this city or that hilltop, right? It's, that's the, the center of gravity of people. And so, so insurgency as a type of warfare brings politics to the fore in the midst of the military affairs. And so that's something that I, that I wanted to do in a, in a, in a game series that became the coin, the coin series. So that was, a, so it was a big part of it, at least in terms of what I was trying to do that was new for war gamers, for traditional war gamers. Now, now this might sound like a fatuous question, but I've, I've heard rumors. So I, this is not based on anything. Uh, this is not based on, on simply nothing, but how did war gamers, so the architect, typal component for the Eurogamer is the cube. And coin games have cubes in them. How did war gamers react to, to having cubes, having Euro components <laughs> in their war games? Well, some did, some, for some that was a turnoff. And I had um, folks who were otherwise interested. So the first of the game was Andy and Abyss about Colombia and it has cubes. Um, and I had folks doing up, mocking up their own um, cardboard counters with a silhouette of a soldier on it, you know, to, instead of the cube, because that was what spoke to them. And, and, and I, I mean, I don't dismiss that reaction because this is a, is a medium and it's representation, right? Mm. You know, yes, it's a cube, but it's not supposed to really be a cube. It really is supposed to be, you know, a, a, a group of workers, mm. right? Or a military unit, you know, or a bale of hay or whatever, right? We're, we're, we're using representation. Well, that means we're using symbols and, and it helps if, if you're communicating in symbols, it helps if they're familiar to mm. your audience. And so, so I was perhaps for that audience bringing in something that was unfamiliar. I had my reasons for doing it as a designer, but for them, it was less transporting, perhaps because it was less familiar in terms of representation, and that makes sense. And and so, to what degree? I, I've always it's it's always been it was said to me before I tried the coin games, and I I think I pretty much agree with the statement. How much do you? agree with the idea that coin games because you're managing resources because you're you're dealing with things that aren't merely sort of artillery and stuff you can say i know nothing about war by the way i'm talking now <laughs> but to what degree do you think that not exactly a meld between euro games and war games but war games that that flirt with sort of euro ideas well I, that was an aim point for me as well um, and it, and it, it grew originally out of the commercial imperative to convince enough people to pre-order, first of all, and then ultimately to, to buy and play a game about insurgency and counterinsurgency in Colombia. So that was a challenge on the war game side, because it's like, you know, I, I care about N N Napoleon and, and Churchill, not about Colombia, mm. you know, so why would I be interested in that? Um, and so I'm looking for every trick I can to attract more people to this game. And one of those tricks was, well, there's a whole lot of folks over here who are used to something that looks rather different, uh, Euro games, um, but are used to having games that are about something, just typically not about insurgency and counterinsurgency, okay? Um, and if I can attract some of that tribe over there, that much larger tribe, mm. right? I can have, I can get this design over the hump in terms of pre-orders and, and the series will hopefully become more popular. So how do I attract them? Well, for them, um, it, I'll reach for mechanics and a physical look that is attractive and familiar. Mm. Um, but that takes them into a world that is based in history and is about serious, consequential, not necessarily um, pretty affairs, but hopefully intriguing affairs. Uh, and so, so I, I'm trying to bridge gaps here. I'm trying to bring tribes together. I'm trying to fill in gaps in the historical repertoire, in the coverage. Mm -hmm. Of the of the medium, 
Uh, and, and, and so the coin series aimed for that. You know, said so every okay, War Gamers, come over here. It's a little bit different topic. Yeah, it looks a bit different with the cubes, but it's also a serious simulation. Try and try it. And for the Euro Gamers, um, yeah, it seems like it's kind of a downer of a of a of a topic, but it's accessible enough, and you'll find it hopefully very 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 interesting and attractive to play. And you might find that the topic is actually quite interesting. So can you give us a can you give us an overview of your process from sort of conception to table? Yeah, I mean it's it's model building. So I, you know it it's not the case that I'm oh well I I you know I want to have x number of of pieces or this kind of mechanics or this number of pl players. It's all right, we want to simulate insurgency in this country. And when we study a complex system, we think of actors and factors, right? So who are the key actors mm. and what are the factors external to them that they interact with that affect them? And then importantly, what, is their, what are their strategies? What are their ends, ways, and means? Well, ends convert to victory conditions, ways to mechanics in terms of things players are doing to advance themselves towards their victory conditions. And means are the, the bits and resources and such that they have to, to, to apply to that. Uh, and so then from there, I'm reaching into my into a designer toolbox of all the war games I've played and what I've you know admired in them and what I think was useful. Other games, you know, this is why it is important that I'm hopefully playing outside of my own, you know, little niche. Um, to, to gain a, a, a greater toolbox, I'm taking things out of there and say, well, this would work well to represent that real world dynamic, whatever it is, right? I'm going to turn it right this way, you know, and I might add another thing on here for the purpose of simulation. But it's it starts with, with conflict simulation. Uh, and then, of course, usually there's a, the trimming because when we then actually put the thing on the table and push things around and are playing and find out, well, you know, of course there are things that don't work very well, or there are things that, you know, aren't, the players don't reach for that, or we don't really need that. In fact, we're completely, we're often forgetting that rule and the game works well without it. You know, our intuition is telling us maybe it's not needed. So then we're also, I'm also looking for things to, to, to cut out um, be, because they're not worth, they're not worth the burden. And so, you know, Coin games are now into double figures with the amount of coin games that are around. You know, when you approach a coin title, is it much, much easier now than it was all that time ago when making Andy and Abyss? Are there sort of building blocks you can put together that, that make the process quicker and simpler? Uh, yes, and I'm, and I'll, tell you honestly it's not me anymore because mm. now very happily for me the the, the series is self-sustaining we have plenty of um talented designers who are bringing in um not only topics i never would have thought of but but approaches to design that i would not have conceived of much less been able to execute myself but if i look at the first few titles yes andy andy and abyss was longer going than the next few, which in terms of design went went reasonably quickly. However, um, you know, for a series, for a, a series of games, and I've, I have a, I've written about this, you know, if you're into double digits, the burden becomes greater and greater each time to demonstrate, well, if I have 11 of these, why do I need a 12th one? Right. Right. So there needs to be absolutely a core connective tissue there so that I'm rewarded. If I've played an earlier volume and I've you know, done the work to learn that, and now I get volume something else of that same series, I expect that I'll have an easier time learning it, you know, just like right. you might have had an easier time designing it. So there does need to be that. However, I have to be, I have to, there has to be a greater and greater divergence with every volume from the initial package yeah right otherwise why is it you know otherwise you're just you know reskinning and why but what's the point i'll just play the first one right so if we look at the games both the topics 
and the mechanics to to uh, represent those settings and the designers involved, right, <laughs> which matters a lot as well. The first four games really have fairly small divergences. So that mm. was a little easier, you know, to take the system that, you know, that we, that, that I came up with for Colombia and use that to represent the Cuban revolution. Um, a reason that, that um, uh, Jeff Grossman, my collaborator in that chose the Cuban revolution that he, you know, something he knew something about, but he said, you know, what you've already done here could fit very well into that because mm. it's telling a very similar story in a not that different setting. Right? So, so the first four, you know, we're diverging us a little bit, but then starting that and starting with, with, with Liberty or Death by Harold Buchanan, I was very, very little involved in that design. And we're in a different century. <laughs> no, yeah. we're it's, in fact, we're in something that, you know, is not commonly um, uh, thought of as insurgency at all, although the, the premise of the game is it is, and, and so on. And so each of the games has a higher burden for new creativity, right? For innovation. Mm. And I think, and I think the series has succeeded because we've, you know, we've, we've met that standard, right? That, that Gandhi, as you, you mentioned, um, there are some things about Gandhi that are fundamentally different, um, mm. uh, such as the nature of, of the, the factions. And, and again, is it an insurgency, you know, and we could discuss that. And so you worked, so, so there, there are very few people in the world and certainly in the world of gaming that could legitimately be called living legends and i think mark herman is certainly one of them he is he is he is the towering presence in war game design and you worked with him on fire in the lake which was yes. the, the vietnam war coin game what did you learn sitting at the feet of the grand master <laughs> yeah um and it, it's interesting um First of all, I learned a lot about the Vietnam War because he's, you know, um, forgotten more about that war than I'll ever learn. Mm. Uh, and and I think we, to some degree, by the way, I, I, I would say Brian Train is, is a legend for me in the design of insurgency games. And a lot of the coin series is inspired by his work. He's my um, co-designer on Andy and on, on, I'm sorry, Disciplane, which was just mm. before Vietnam. And in both of those cases, I think I learned a lot about um, how you know how a, a division of labor can work successfully and efficiently between two designers, um, in that um, you know Mark Herman already had a a very fully worked out model of the v of the U.S. and Vietnam and the Vietnam War in his head hmm. that he'd been waiting for a long time to sort of design a game and hadn't gotten around to it. Um, and we, we talked about that quite a bit before we did any mechanical design. And I sort of had a, you know, a chassis for that. You know, I had the, the, the coin series that seemed to fit his view of the history of the mm. war quite well. And so, he, so that's sort of how we divided things up. And he would, for example, come up with, well, here are you know, here's what should be on the map. And here's that, and I would sort of engineer it, you know, and make right. it a coin map, if you will. And he would come up with lists of here are all the kinds of events and personalities and technologies and what their, what their effects should be on play in a historical sense. And then I would, you know, coinify that into, mm -hmm. into cards, into the card, card deck. Right. And, uh, it worked similar, uh, similarly with, with Brian train, um, and, and it was a little more mixed, I think, with, with, with Jeff Grossman. So, so that just worked extraordinarily well. And that kind of partnership, I mean, with Mark, of course, and Brian, they're both, like you say, to, to me, legendary game designers. They're not just, it's not just they know the history and they understand right. them. Right? But it did, it did suggest to me, and something I experienced at work, that that, that is a, a, a very effective pairing of experts in creating simulation games hmm. uh, for professional purposes as well. And that is somebody who has the, the mechanical board game sense, has that toolbox, and, and somebody who has that well-developed mental model of some complex affair, some complex human endeavor. And, and, and you put those two together 
to try to put um, that model on onto the table. And uh, and I, I saw that kind of collaboration happen in the professional sphere, sphere um, time and again, and um, it, yeah, and 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 of course, you know, Mark Herman, someone like Mark Herman, he doesn't need he doesn't need that. But if you even with him, I think if you if you do that, if you put two different kinds of expertise together, you're going to get something more special out. You know, you're going to mm -hmm. get a synthesis, right, of of um, two ways of doing the systems thinking on a topic. So I've got two more questions then for you. So the the first one is conventions are back on and you you go out for dinner in the evening and you're, you're coming back from the loo and there's a, there's a table and you hear your name mentioned. So you sidle into the corner and you eavesdrop on them. What do you hope they're saying about you? In, in connection with games, obviously. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping they're talking about a game that, I was involved in a, a design that I did, and I hope what they're saying about it is, um, yeah, that really transported me in, into that time. You know, that really made me feel like I was making decisions, like the actors were, and, or that really got me to think and look at the situation the way I think those people historically did. You know, and I've had that, and I've had that kind of experience um i mean happily in which um with the coin series for example somebody said well i played it you know once and um i just got i just got taken apart and i didn't see how to win but then i started thinking about it the way a gorilla would think about it and i did much better right and that just makes me feel like the the game design has enabled them to travel to something that you know, I mean, you wouldn't want to be involved with mm -hmm. yourself, right? And and you you couldn't, you can't go back in time in that way. But but here's a vehicle that helps us um, helps us do that. And that's you know that's what I that's what I want from 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 games I play, and that's what I'm I'm hoping to deliver. So that's what I hope they would say is that that it you know Volko's game took me somewhere. So my last question then is, why is gaming good well we as as, as play we all you know mammals play and play is play is good for all kinds of reasons but if you mean you know board gaming specifically it adds not just another medium for us to experience explore enjoy and think about our world but an especially powerful one because it, it's dynamic. You know, it's not just like watching a movie or reading a book where you get the same thing. You're creating the story yourself, but you're doing so within a framework, a model that somebody who has spent some time thinking about some complex affair has given you. And, and you're, you're pulling the levers and operating the machine and, and, and observing what happens. And it gives us an ability to, to understand complex interactions that is unbeatable. I can't think of any way other than board games that are about something mm -hmm. that, that we can as effectively understand complex dynamics. Brilliant. Well, Volko Runker, thank you very much for giving over your time. My, my pleasure. This was uh, <laughs> this was an enlightening conversation for me.